Thank you very much, because this is a very exciting opportunity uh, to be here at Averton and to talk about IVI. So who are we? IVI is UN chartered, but we're independent uh, of the United Nations. We're actually founded by the United Nations Development Program, and our mission is to discover, develop, and deliver safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health with a vision of seeing developing countries free from suffering from vaccine-preventable infectious diseases. So what do we, uh, so the 218 people at IVI um, from 26 different countries around the world work in over 28 uh, countries and 44 different sites in, in Asia, Latin America, um, Africa, uh, to do the work of IVI's mission. And you'll see the, the products that we work on and the types of, of activities that we're engaged with on a, on a uh, slide, a, a slide a little bit farther on in the deck. We were the first international organization located in Korea. And, and I, you know, it's amazing that, you know, Korea, the Korean War, and Korea really arose out of the ashes. I mean, you know, Ghana is celebrated in Korea because they donated $10,000 to the government of Korea back in the 1950s. Because the, the economy was completely devastated by first the invasion, then push, pushing the North Koreans back, then the Chinese coming south again, and then the US and the, and the United Nations pushing the Chinese north of the 38th parallel. That destruction was enormous, and Korea had a GDP lower than, uh, well, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. And so when they decided to make, to, be, to host an international organization, they took on a very important commitment to supporting IVI. And so we're very lucky uh, in that regard. 39 countries and WHO are state parties, and you can see that a significant number of countries are on their way, hopefully, to becoming member states at IVI. And becoming a member state is important in one sense. That is that um, countries that are funders of IVI um, actually have a seat on the board. But last, oh sorry, in May this year, countries that uh, are not funders um, are also allowed onto the board of trustees. So the Global Council will pick two countries that are non-funders to sit on the board. And a seat on the board is a seat on the highest uh, executive, or sorry, um, governance body within, within IVI. So this is a map of where in the world IVI works. And you can see the sites around the world are concentrated in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. You can see that there are little dots out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. That's a study that we're doing in Fiji. And then actually, uh, we're working in Ukraine and New Zealand um, because some of the COVID vaccines that are being tested and, and in order to secure WHO, uh, sorry, European Union approval, we had to diversify the population so we couldn't only do studies in, in the places where IVI normally works. So we had a site in Ukraine, which is very exciting, uh, as you might imagine. We got all the data out and now we have all the samples. So they completed the trial despite being invaded. Um, and that's a real testament to the quality of the people who are involved in the trial. You can see also that, that IVI now has a, has a, um, a regional office <clears throat> in Europe. It's the first time we've opened a formal regional office. So you can think of us a little bit like WHO. We have a headquarters in Seoul and a regional office in Europe. And the reason for the regional office in Europe is you can imagine that to secure EDCTP funding or to work at the Horizons program, we actually have to be based in Europe. We had a way around that for a while. We were working, we actually have a collaboration with Cambridge, a university in the UK, um, but they're no longer a part of the EU. So we had to scramble and think of a new approach. And Sweden has been enormously supportive. For 20 years, they've supported IVI. And they put forward $25 million in funding over five years uh, to support this office. And we're using that funding to leverage additional grants. So it would be great if we just hired lots of people. But no, we're, what we're doing is keeping the staff relatively small and focused on, on projects, but using that funding as a way to secure additional funding. So we've committed to the Gates and to the Wellcome Trust to put a million dollars each of funding into new projects that will work on uh, the HPV vaccine or on a new version of the cholera vaccine, um, <clears throat> which MSF requested, uh, which is heat stable at 40 degrees uh, for three months uh, and, can, and is available in capsule form. So it can be distributed very rapidly during an outbreak. So again, you know, these are, it's an opportunity. We've never been a funder before. 
Um, and that's created new and, and, and other kind of uh, complications. But it's important because in order to advance the work we do, we need to collaborate with people. And, and if we have funding, we need to commit it because the work that we do is very important. And if the only way we can get funding is to commit funding of our own, then, then that's something we have to do as well. You can see that we have now three collaborating centers. And you, you probably wondered why IVI, an organization that is a development-based or organization, does not have a site in Africa. There was a philosophical discussion, actually a very intense one, around whether we wanted to build a like IVI, you know, fancy building and locate it somewhere in Africa. And the, the initial thought was no, that our commitment is actually to develop local capacity to train people um, in uh, our collaborators so that we can apply with them uh, for grants. So <clears throat> the first grant with with the uh, University of Antananarivo in Madagascar as the, as the PI, with IVI as a subcontractor, um, has been uh, put in. And, and that's the goal, is to train and build sustainable capacity for research and development, and now I actually through the efforts of, of Alice Lee and, and others in this room, sustainable manufacturing in Africa. Our, that's our commitment. Whether we needed a, an IVI in, um, branch office in, in Africa was a big question. And, and we've actually gotten some, and I'd be really happy to hear your advice on this also, but we've gotten some opinions from different um, global health and, and foreign affairs leaders uh, who form a, a different advisory council. Anyway, so quickly then uh, through IVI. So you see discover, develop, and deliver, and then we added epi and surveillance because not a lot of organizations fund epidemiology or burden assessments or effectiveness trials, but they're really a critical part of what we do. Why? Because the places, the diseases we work on aren't well-defined. There isn't a lot of information available on non-typhoidal salmonella or shigella or schistosomiasis or there's a disease called leptospirosis which is very common it turns out in Africa but no one diagnoses it because there are no kits there are no diagnostics we don't really understand the burden of these diseases and we can't therefore come up with reasonable investment cases because we we can't convince countries that that aren't aware of diseases and, and this has happened before it was true of cholera, it was true of typhoid, and now with increased uh, study, we know that these are diseases of substantial burden, and it's easy to convince countries uh, that it's necessary to embark on vaccination programs in order to reduce the overall burden of disease. But what you can see on the bottom line here is organized by things in the lab, things in clinical development, things that are, being, that are already approved, and then things that we're studying for epidemiological purposes, the different kinds of uh, diseases that IVI works on. So there are vaccines at different stages of development for each of these diseases, and you can see them here at the bottom of the screen. What the rest of the slide tells you is uh, it's a menu of what the 218 people at IVI do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think one of the important things to, that, that won't come up on any of the slides is that, you know, so far we haven't taken any patents out on our vaccines. The idea was that these vaccines are available for global health, and we are willing to tech transfer these vaccines, for instance, to BioVac, um, because we think it's important to have a vaccine that is regionally important, that can be manufactured here, and for which there's a huge shortfall in production globally. Um, so again, this will be something to make in between uh, the big pandemics, uh, but will keep capacity warm and going and train people to be able to work in sustainable vaccine manufacturing um, in Africa. Why would they be interested in vaccines? I mean, this is a minor industry, and, but you know, the people who founded IVI were actually thinking a bit ahead of where most of us are. In 1997, they, they said, you know, we think this is a green industry, it's highly technological, um, and so, and, and these are things that Korea really believes in, you know, green growth and, 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 and tech-based industry. <laughs> And we have a lot of people in Korea who can do this, but then of course, there's always a, something that prompts the government. And the thing that prompted them was actually not this pandemic, but the previous one, um, the pandemic influenza pandemic of 2010. Korea was informed by the US government that <clears throat> based on US laws, they could confiscate all the vaccine that Korea had purchased um, for US use uh, if um, the US needs required um, uh, influenza vaccine. It's not uncommon, we saw it actually during COVID. Vaccine nationalism, this is the original vaccine nationalism. 
And but Korea was a little bit, I, and actually Thailand was as well, a little shocked that that an ally would tell them that well that's not your vaccine that it's made in the U.S. It could be our vaccine. Um, so they started to think, what do we need? And and so vaccines 3.0 was the product of that. And there were IVI scientists involved in the government panel that came up with the idea that Korea should be 80% self-sufficient in vaccines and should move from being the number 11 vaccine manufacturer to the number five vaccine manufacturer. So this is back in 2010. When we presented this to our board, just the concept, they said, this is crazy. No one will ever do this. Well, by 2016, the Korean government had invested in two large pilot plants, each of which has one or two 1,000 liter fermenters. Uh, that, that is the basis for, actually it will be one of the sites for training, for um, the hands-on training for, for vaccine manufacturing. And they also built the Vaccine Research Center of the KNIH, uh, which is a, a, a way for the government to advance uh, vaccine R&D. Then they came up with the right fund, and IVI was actually very intimately involved in lobbying companies and the government to put in money with the Gates Foundation and to put in their own private funding to get things over that first valley of death. So, you know, there are many great ideas in universities but not a lot of them see the light of day because you just can't get things out of the lab. And, and you know, if you're a professor, um, you often think, well, just one more experiment and I'll come up with a perfect vaccine. And you're not committed to a process of vaccine development that will get you to a product. Well, the right fund was intended to do that. And so with funding from those three organizations, Gates, Korean government and the, and the companies, uh, we can get vaccines, drugs and diagnostics out of universities and into clinical trials uh, with funding through the Right Fund. It's now called the Right Foundation, actually not the Right Fund. Then in 2020, and this is again in the middle of the pandemic, this effort that, that IVI and, and other universities, major uh, vaccine research institutions, actually mainly translational immunology kind of uh, universities, put together these proposals to, to train PhDs and technicians to do uh, biotechnology. And so these research and development hubs, and now there are three of them, they represent a $400 million investment over five to 10 years to train PhDs, technicians, to bring new technologies into Korea for vaccine R&D, including now, in our, there's actually a separate mRNA hub. There's a hub for global vaccines, and there's a hub for vaccines that Korea could find of use as well. All with the goal of becoming self-sufficient and becoming a vaccine manufacturing uh, powerhouse. And so, in 2020 now, Korea has gone from being 20% self-sufficient to being 50%, 40 to 50% self-sufficient, with the goal to be 80% by 2025. Then finally in 2021, and I think this was encouraged by the pandemic, the government invested $2 billion to um, provide research and development credits and other ways for companies to build manufacturing capability within Korea. And we participated in actually all of the discussions for all of these and, and we're actually intimately involved probably in the first two. And then we're a collaborator with all of the three research um, and development hubs in uh, Vital Korea. And then with K Vaccine, I think if you don't know, oh, Alice is sitting back there. She's the um, global training hub for biomanufacturing lead for IVI. So the 300, actually now 450 people came to IVI this year for training. Uh, were in the programs that Alice helped to set up. So how do we do what we do? We partner. I mean, we can't, and we only 218 people. So we have to work with people around the world. So governments, um, universities, philanthropies like the Gates Foundation, global health organizations, and industry. I mean, we, we know that we are actually forbidden from making our own vaccines. So when IVI has a vaccine, we have to tech transfer it. And it's, it's a part of what we do it's a part of capacity building to be able to take that forward and work with other organizations uh, to move vaccines forward. And, and, and it sounds like I'm, it, it's going to sound funny, but it's almost like crowdfunding certain vaccines, hepatitis E vaccine. So there's been a vaccine that we've known about for 15 years, 95% efficacious at three years and five years. So, and, um, and it's not pre-qualified. And it, you know, the disease kills 30 to 70,000 people a year, many of them women in the third trimester of pregnancy because it has a 20 to 40% mortality in that particular group. There's no pre-qualified vaccine. SAGE declined to recommend it. And when there are outbreaks in, in Mali or Sudan, no, com no country will use it because it's not recommended by WHO. So 
We have funding from the Gates Foundation, from the Thrasher Fund, and from Open Philanthropy to move the trial in pregnant women forward. And hopefully we'll, we'll, get, we'll start working with South Africa because one of the other trials that we'd like to do uh, is in people who are infected with HIV AIDS. Uh, and hopefully that trial can be done here. But again, developing the evidence with whatever funding we can put together is really important part because, you know, you know global health, right? We don't have the, um, the luxury of being able to say, well, we don't want to get, we don't want your money. Uh, we will work with people who want to move vaccines forward in order to get products for global health. IVC is the uh, International Vaccinology course. We've done this for 21 years now. 3,000 people have come through. Uh, Seoul, actually, there was a period where it was all virtual. Um, so this is a week-long training. Then the GTHB, which Alice runs, that's a two to three week training in vaccine development, actually much more intense than the one week course. And then a GXP course, which was three weeks in duration. Um, that was done uh, in November. Then we work with GHSA, Global Health Sec um, Security Agenda. Um, and then with eight ASEAN countries, which really now led by Thailand and some of the other countries in the region are really focusing on their own needs for vaccine security through a number of different things, including um, vaccine manufacturing capability. And then of course, technology transfer, and I'll have more of those. So IVI has done, has, or has been engaged in nine different technology transfers of four different vaccines. You can see the oral cholera vaccines here. They're not all the same. The one that will go to BioVac is actually a new, um, product formulation that's been funded by the Gates Foundation uh, that is simpler. And why simpler? Well, it turns out that the old vaccine had components in it that we don't think are necessary, and it reduces the number of strains from five to two. That actually significantly decreases the cost, but also increases um, the capacity to manufacture. So it, it means we can make more of a cheaper product, which actually, you know, again, would be one of the goals of, of a vaccine for disease, um, that's in short supply now globally. Um, these are some of the others, typhoid conjugate vaccine. We call that vaccine number two because SK's vaccine was just approved by the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety and is now um, under review for WHO pre-qualification. Biopharmas is under review by their regulatory authority. We also tech transferred the NIH dengue vaccine to Va Biotech and, and, and Butantan. And then the, the last vaccine is one, a non-typhoidal salmonella bivalent, actually it's a trivalent vaccine. It's two non-typhoidal salmonella strains and typhoid uh, salmonella typhi. And that's been tech transferred to SK Bioscience. So this kind of summarizes everything IVI does. We start with a need, say cholera, um, and we work with a vaccine uh, manufacturer. This is really important for us because in the end, we can do pilot manufacturing in Korea or in Europe uh, or in um, different parts of in North America, but that's not what a vaccine needs. A vaccine needs a real manufacturer. And so we have to be able to identify a developing country manufacturer that will manufacture a vaccine to meet the cholera need. We then work with funding from organizations like Gates to do the manufacturing and the clinical trials to support the company in, in its approach to uh, licensure. And then eventually um, move on from providing the supply to creating demand. And by creating demand, so this is to remind everyone that, you know, we had these COVID vaccines. They're amazing vaccines. Yet 75% of people in low-income countries are not vaccinated, haven't received a single dose. We haven't done what we normally do for global health vaccines, which is to create a cost-effectiveness analysis and an investment case that convinces countries that this is something that, that has a benefit to the population as well as being a cost-effective approach to healthcare. And so we have to do that for cholera vaccine and for typhoid conjugate vaccine, actually ongoing, actually at the same time as the USP meeting, the TCV introduction into Africa uh, meeting is being held. So that's where I was today um, to talk about, you know, these very issues and how important introduction of, of typhoid conjugate vaccine could be uh, for different countries, but we have to generate the data. And that's really a critical part of what we do and a really essential part of getting to the very end, which is impact, which is really about what this glo these global health vaccines are all about, impact. It's not only lives saved, save, but decreased disability associated life years, healthier families, which means lower poverty. Actually, a lot of the talks today focused on the impact of intestinal perforation, which is a consequence of typhoid, 
on, um, on the family's uh, economic status for the next several years. So a typhoid um, infection, a severe typhoid infection, sets a family back by years. A simple infection like measles can put a family below the poverty level for nine months. So these are the kinds of things we think about vaccines in terms of life and death, but there are other very important parts of vaccines that we can put into economic analyses that help governments think about the reason for implementing uh, vaccine campaigns. So that was IVI. <laughs> um, now about the, the gaps. So it's easiest for me to think about this in, in terms of three gaps. I think I talked about this during, my, uh, my, during the panel discussion. The first gap is not a vaccine at all, but it's diagnostics. And really, you know, the access to COVID tools accelerator Act A estimated a $7 billion need. The gap initially was $2 billion. These were without test kits. Countries couldn't tell uh, where the pandemic was, who it was affecting, who was dying of it. Um, and, and that was really important. It's almost like, you know, being blindfolded, like Uncle Sam up there, um, because the U.S. didn't have test kits in the first few months. And it was funny because Debbie Burks, um, who is the COVID coordinator, and I think some people will know her as the PEPFAR uh, ambassador back in the old days, um, was calling Italy, Spain, is, she told us this, Italy, Spain, and South Korea to get data to model the pandemic in the United States because they couldn't get real-time data because they had no tests. So again, it applies to everybody. We need testing. But the other part of it is not only the diagnostic test kits, but it's something whoops, that um, South Africa can be, can be actually very proud of because the contribution that South African scientists made to the identification of new pandemic strains is really substantial. What you see here is the real, you know, the real um, COVID-19 tree. And then this is just a science paper that came out about a couple of weeks ago now. Um, where did Omicron originate? Did it actually come out of a number of different introductions in, in West Africa that really went unnoticed because sequencing capacity wasn't there? So, so uh, the laboratories here, um, uh, Tulio and, and his crew were able to do it because South Africa has a system for bringing in strains, for sequencing them, and for identifying uh, strains that are emerging. Other countries do not. So it's not only diagnostic kits, but it's the ability to do sequencing to analyze them and to make them known to others so that we can start uh, looking for them on a global scale. So the bottom line here is you can't find a pandemic you can't see or a variant you don't know. But the diagnostic gap had other practical circumstances. So you see here, this is from Johns Hopkins, the reported deaths per one, one million people. And you can see the countries that did well or less well. This is as of September, 2021. And I use this number because the next one is the IHME projection. So the IHME is, a, is modeling, and you can see that there's a substantial difference primarily here in, in Africa. Uh, there appeared, or there was a suggestion that there may be more deaths, but are we really sure this is really modeling? It's in, I mean, in silico analysis. We didn't have diagnostics. So we didn't know that people who were dying were dying, elderly who were dying were dying of pneumonia or dying of COVID um, or something else. Um, and really here, this is the IHME ratio. If it's more red or orange, it's a, it's a significant number of excess deaths over the number of reported deaths. And you can see again uh, where those might be. Uh, but it includes some um, high income countries. You know, this is the, the Northern Territories of, um, of Canada, for instance, where data are not always um, readily accessible. Um, so do countries and people worry about diseases that don't kill anyone? So if you were a country, you didn't know that you had many deaths from COVID. We now have a COVID vaccine, but it's going to cost you in order to deploy it. Do you really want to deploy it? it? Didn't kill anybody that we know of. So again, diagnostics are really critical and, it, and that gap really hurt us in the end. The second gap is manufacturing. And that's one that we're here today to address. Um, I think the most um, important thing that I think about is, you know, in a period of 12 months, we made 12 billion doses of COVID vaccine a really remarkable number. The problem, of course, was not that we manufactured the vaccines because we got over the manufacturing problem within 12 months, really remarkable effort. But the vaccines were not distributed equitably. And by the 
the fourth quarter of 2021, so a year ago, we were already destroying vaccines. Countries in Africa were asking IBI if we had any use for vaccines that they were about to destroy, which again is, gets to the idea that it's actually the distribution that is problematic. So vaccine manufacturing, of course, is concentrated in North America, Europe, China, and India. Um, so there's a maldistribution of manufacturing capability that we're hoping that all of the efforts that we're doing now are going to help to address, to strengthen regional manufacturing and build regional capacity, not only to do manufacturing, but to do the research and development that goes into the steps before manufacturing. Because if all you're doing is filling and finishing a drug that's manufactured in, in China, India, North America, or Europe, you're not actually accomplishing a sustainable vaccine manufacturing e ecosystem. The next part is the distribution. And we all know, I think, that the distribution was not equitable. You know, there was a plan to do that. Um, equity was much more challenging than supply. And you can see here, um, the countries that, that still really haven't administered enough uh, COVID-19. 13 billion doses have been given since the start of vaccination in, in December of 2020. Um, two thirds of the world has received at least a single dose, which again, for a vaccine is remarkable. For other vaccines, rotavirus vaccine, we've been using it for 16 years. 60% of the world's children have not received a single dose. So with COVID, we're actually doing really well. It was remarkable and we, we need to do better, obviously. 75% um, of people in low-income countries are unvaccinated. And this just gets to the idea around rotavirus vaccine here, introduced in the United States within three years, we were at 70%. Um, but in many parts of the world, we haven't been vaccinated. 60% of the world's children have not completed their three doses of rotavirus vaccine. 16 years after it was approved by the, in the United States, 13 years after it was approved and recommended by WHO, there is an equity uh, shortfall that has existed for a long time. But this gets to a vaccination gap. And this is a paper by the Tony Blair Institute for Social Change talking about the absorption capacity challenge. Well, really what this is about is how do programs that are already stressed at delivering, you know, EPI vaccines to 80% of the, of the birth cohort. So if you think birth cohort is 130 million globally, the world's population is 8 billion. So the organizations that are stressed delivering vaccine to the kids are really going to be stressed delivering vaccines to everybody. And that stress is actually a cost a cost in capacity, but also an actual cost. And this is uh, data from UNDP. What are shown in the black dots here are low-income countries. And this is the proportion of their health budget, their total health budget, that would be used in order to vaccinate 40% of the population. In Mali, it was 40% of the health budget. So you would have to have a pretty strong investment case to be able to justify taking all those healthcare resources and putting it into COVID vaccination. But of course, no one died of COVID because we weren't doing any testing. So it becomes a circular argument, but you see the point here is what we really need is health system strengthening. So as we think about um, efforts around the world to strengthen healthcare delivery, this is a really key step because unless we can vaccinate the people who need to be vaccinated, then we're not going to be able to um, do better than we did this time. So this again gets to uh, the COVAX, which I think is a remarkable effort. And I, and I probably said so too many times, it was supposed to deliver 2 billion doses of WHO um, emergency use listed vaccines by the end of 2021 and it, and it failed. It, was, it delivered under a billion doses and it delivered them relatively late so that countries that could were out in the open market scrambling, bidding for the, any vaccine they could get a hold of. And so health minister of Ecuador was on our board of trustees and she said, we, by June, had not received anything, and we were getting desperate. So we bought Sinovac. It was available, $20 a dose. They were willing to give us a slight discount. We vaccinated 9 million people in 100 days, and we went from having people, dead people stacked up outside of emergency rooms to being an example of how effective vaccination works. But that wasn't the point. COVAX was supposed to protect those people who were dying and being stacked up outside of emergency rooms, and it just wasn't available soon enough. And that gets to the idea that we still had lots of things to do. The failure of access and equity we'll, we'll talk about later, but it had humanitarian, economic, and biological consequences. An unspoken part of this is vaccine hesitancy. And actually what I focused on actually here is a paper from Peterson 
um, that came out in vaccines just recently. It's the level of resistance to vaccination for COVID in healthcare workers. You know, if anyone has to be able to be convincing about, it's not necessarily the doctor who often isn't involved in vaccination at all. Um, he or she may give a, you know, an order for a vaccine or would encourage people to be vaccinated, but they don't deliver the vaccine. The person who's talking to the patient getting a vaccine, uh, the, the person receiving a vaccine is actually the nurse or healthcare provider. If they're not convinced, we're gonna have a really hard time convincing individuals who already heard all the horror stories about the chip that Bill Gates is implanting in us or the poisons that are in it or you know, the, you know, the idea that you become sterile after you get a vaccine. So someone has to, we have to do a better job. You know, we've met the enemy and the enemy is us. Um, we need to get better at, at being able to convince healthcare workers uh, that vaccines are safe and efficacious. We need to rebuild that consensus. Now that consensus, that thing that formed Gabby, that provides now 80 to 85% of vaccines to children around the world, that consensus has been fractured by the politics around COVID. And we, you know, we have time, but we need to rebuild it. Um, why? Because it's not only COVID, it's about all the vaccines we give. And this goes to the number of zero dose children, which rose really dramatically during the pandemic. Now we have to vaccinate those children and we have to have the nurses and, and doctors and, and healthcare workers and ministries of health convinced that vaccination is doing an amazing job. And we think that it is. I mean, the statistics from UNICEF and Gavi, 2.5 million lives are saved every year by EPI program vaccines. This is something that was really important, that is really important, and we can't let it be a victim to all the anti-vax, uh, the vaccine trust and acceptance issues that rose during the pandemic. The final gap is the leadership gap. I talk about this all the time. Again, that's the Emerson Quartet. They're a great string quartet. Um, and you know, that's been our approach to global health. A lot of people with goodwill coming to the table, some of them like the Gates Foundation bringing a lot of funding, some of them countries that bring a lot of funding and we get great ideas, but we, you know, we don't have to work together. We kind of understand the, we understand the music we want to play. But a pandemic is a little bit different than a string quartet. Really, when we talk about a pandemic, we're, we're, we have to think that this is not a Mozart string quartet. This is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony with the orchestra and the choir, and you need a real conductor. You need a leader to help move this forward. And do we have that person? Well, in the United States, it was Tony Fauci who's retiring, unfortunately. But, you know, think about the crisis. Who stepped up? Who would normally step up? Who helped to make sure that the billions of dollars that were available would be usable? And who is ready to say, okay, the US invested $18 billion in Operation Warp Speed, and that gave them a vaccine, but how are we gonna get that vaccine into the arms of people? Because in the end, it isn't the vaccine that saves you, it's the vaccination that saves you. And someone needed to think through that chain, including the logistics, including the, health, the support for healthcare workers, including all those things that we need to think about in order to make a vaccine effective. So failure to bridge the gaps um, results in a number of things. And these are just the deaths per million. And I think everyone's familiar with the 6.6 .6 million deaths officially, the maybe 15 to 20 million deaths that WHO and IHME are saying probably happened during the pandemic. The numbers are kind of mind numbing. Um, the other thing that's mind numbing is, I, and I'm not an economist, and, and I very rarely have to think in terms of trillions of dollars. I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, they were saying, ah, maybe this will be $20 trillion. And then in the end, it was five or six trillion. And, you know, and maybe, you know, there were all these numbers being thrown around and all with, you know, at 10 to the 12th um, figures. But this is a, um, a slide and this is where you can get it. Um, so this is where we would be in terms of GDP growth globally over time. And, and so you can see that in 2019, we're about $137 trillion in total global GDP. Now, this is what happened during the pandemic. It dropped, which is what you'd expect, but it doesn't come back up to the, the old trajectory. It remains below that trajectory for a decade. So that means that it's not just $5 trillion. It's $5 trillion continuously over time. And so what they've done here is, oops, they provided an estimate for us. Uh, this is GDP loss uh, globally as a proportion of the GDP in 2019. 
So you can see here, 54% is the GDP loss. They also included the fiscal stimuluses. So in the U US, it was, it was several hundred billion dollars a time of money spent to support people because the pandemic created a lot of economic distress. So that's included there. This is an odd thing, statistical value of deaths. So this means that for all those 20 million people who died, if they had lived, they would have contributed a huge amount to society. So they, the statisticians came up with this construct, the statistical value of death. And of course, if you're in Korea or in the United States, the value of your life is substantial. If you were in, um, you know, in Mali or in Mozambique, you're, the value of your life is lower, but still important relative to the contribution that you would make to society in general. But this statistical value of life accounts for 16% of 2019 GDP. And when you add in the impact of the lockdowns on education, now this is going to be, this is generational. If children were out of school for a year or two years in some places, I mean, what is the impact? I mean, we know that education has tremendous impacts downstream on, on productivity and economies. And so this is another uh, number here, 12%, which is the additive effect of the impact of keeping kids out of school for one or two years. So in total, the broad economic cost is 98.1% of 2019 GDP. That amount is $37 trillion. There's a huge cost. If we just count you know, GDP, that's fine, but there are other costs and, and we, we need to take them into account as well. The final um, impact was on mutants. So outbreaks make variants and variants make outbreaks. And I think China, we're gonna see what happens in China now that the great experiment has started. Um, are there gonna be new variants generated in China as the pandemic uh, explodes in populations that have been vaccinated but not infected? I use South Africa here because actually um, the waves are very well defined. Uh, actually, you can see it most clearly here and you can see where the different variants contribute to the waves. So for the future pandemic, bridge to the four gaps, the diagnostics gap, the manufacturing gap, the vaccination gap, the diagnostics gap, again, we talked about no deaths from COVID, no fear, no uptake, no impact. Manufacturing gap, if there's no vaccine, or the vaccine doesn't get to the right place, there's no vaccinations and no impact. The vaccination gap, if there's no vaccine or vaccinator or an arm available because people don't wanna be vaccinated, then there's no vaccination and no impact. And the consequences, more death, more cost, more mutants. And we'd hope that global leadership will fill this gap um, and help us to work together, to put together a solution that works for everybody, um, not just for one country or another country. So um, this is just IVI and, and uh, what, what we did during the pandemic, we don't have our own vaccine. We worked with any company or organization that had a vaccine that they needed to test in animals, in humans, in effectiveness trials, in order to make sure that there were going to be vaccines that were available for COVID. So thanks. Is that for, are you looking at out-of-facility vaccination of newborns? So is this really about the first dose? Because clearly the, the, the three childhood doses are all now in a pentavalent or hexavalent vaccine. One of the big export industries in Korea is actually cosmetics. And cosmetics um, nowadays um, use patches, which I didn't know. Um, but they, you know, these patches with microneedles on them have different substances in them that make wrinkles go away, that make your skin lighter and tighter and um, do all these wonderful things. But the Korean government was thinking, well, we have all this manufacturing capability. I wonder if this could be used for vaccine delivery. And then there was this uh, WHO Gavi effort around microneedle patches uh, as a way to get a, to increase the, the ease of delivery. And so, we happened to have hepatitis B vaccine. We happened to have two companies that had patches and it was a quick proof of concept uh, that we would be able to, to get equivalent uh, levels of anti-HB, uh, anti-hepatitis B 
um, antibody, you know, because we had the assays, we had the antigen, we had the patches. Um, it turns out that maybe measles rubella will be a, a different target, maybe a better one. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to acquire that, um, the capacity, either to acquire measles rubella lyophilized, or, and, and a second thing is to acquire the measles rubella vaccine so that IVI can tech transfer that. Because it, it might be an easy vaccine to manufacture uh, for, for countries that are looking for something to do in between pandemic waves. So yes, but hepatitis B was exactly that. Uh, and COVID would be another one, but we didn't have the COVID vaccine at the time. Uh, but we had this and we actually showed that in mice, the patch was equivalent to an injected um, hepatitis B. And so now that's moving forward into human clinical trials, hopefully by the middle of next year, um, uh, with hepatitis B. Good afternoon, everyone. For me, it's not a question, it's a comment. I already am grateful for the slide that showed the impact of the vaccines within the community because, like, I represent the communities as a community lead in within the clinical research site. And uh, I find that if we can keep on preaching the benefits of any vaccine availability, because when you see that, like, uh, it increases, it, it decreases the number of deaths, and it improves like the level of poverty because if we are not vaccinated within our communities, then more people will die and we will be struggling with more offense and childhood and families. And that's not how community always appreciates and sees the need of being vaccinated. And secondly, we always struggling with the issue of health workers who are continuously, since I was born, they were always talking about immunization. But now when we're talking about vaccinations, they don't relate the two that they've been immunized themselves. They don't click and relate the two together. When you talk to health workers about like immunization and vaccination, they will find all the critical reasons. So as communities, we are continuously doing so much. And it's not an easy thing because the community is split into two. Communities are clever. They're smarter than the health workers because they've been in these clinical trials and the nurses are less interested in even participating or hearing about the clinical trials. So within working with health workers, not only in South Africa globally, we still have a lot and we need to invest more in that kind. Thank you so much. But, but you make a great point, which is, you know, we think about immunization and we think about kids. Increasingly, we have to think about life course immunization, right? I mean, influenza vaccine in the elderly, RSV vaccine when it's available in, in people who are older, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the vaccine for zoster. Um, you know, all of these are vaccines that we are going to start giving to people who are elderly. The influenza vaccine actually can be given to, to everyone, uh, in the US anyway it is. Um, we know that they have, vaccines have tremendous additional benefits. I mean, we, we didn't see it with COVID, but herd protection uh, really is remarkable. I mean, in, in some countries in Africa, when you vaccinate the, the kids with, um, against pneumonia with pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the overall mortality rate in the country goes down. The grandparents, the elderly in the community are protected against invasive pneumococcal disease. When they vaccinated children in Japan for influenza, grandma and grandpa didn't get influenza. So again, these are really important things and we don't talk about them a lot. And we should. I think the final point is that I come out of the HIV vaccine groups. We really believe in community engagement. We don't often see that uh, in, in many, in, in, we don't see that in adult immunization programs, but it's really important. When we are doing cholera vaccination in Mozambique, the community engagement is a really important part about informing people about uh, what cholera is, the risks of it, you know, with the global, with climate change and the, and the, you know, two times a year cyclones that hit Mozambique, cholera is a real problem. Um, but we have to talk to people about it because, you know, for a long time, it was acute watery diarrhea. We couldn't call in anything else. Actually in Ethiopia, when we did our first vaccination campaign there, we were not allowed to call it. You were receiving oral cholera vaccine for acute watery diarrhea. Um, but these are really important. We have to be able to communicate. And I think that's the, the biggest point that you make is there needs to be effective communication. And this is a part of vaccination and vaccination programs and making them successful. So great point. Uh, because a lot of the uh, pandemics that we have actually have a zoonotic origin. COVID itself, in fact, you know, comes from animals, so that's a zoonosis as well. And, uh, and so I wanted to, to just get your thoughts on uh, how uh, IVF positions itself 
within the context of one health, which is something very important these days because of climate change and the interaction of humans with animals, if you're getting closer to them, and so on, therefore the transmission of, of viruses from animals to humans becomes a big issue, and that becomes a, a huge source of outbreaks and, uh, and, 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 and new, uh, new organisms, for instance, because of recombination and all that. So, so, uh, so far, I think the, the, com the comments have been, or the presentation has been centered around humans, but I wanted to see in the context of one health, uh, if you can just offer your comment on that. Thank you. So, you know, from, our, from the perspective of diagnostics, that's really a critical part of being able to identify diseases, zoonotic diseases, that could uh, make a transition into humans. The point that you make about the pressures that human populations put on animal populations, the point about climate change, the, um, the, the likelihood of, of transmission events between um, animals and humans is increasing because of the things that we do. Um, the other part and, um, would be antimicrobial resistance. The use of antibiotics and animal feed have a dramatic impact on a AMR. And, and, the, and our ability to fight against uh, these diseases. And really, you know, again, we've had really intense discussions with the board. Actually, it's brought up again just recently, so it's not over yet. But the question of whether IVI should work on antimicrobial resistance, um, it's the coming pandemic. We know that by 2050, 10 million people a year will die of, of AMR, uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, bacteria. We also know that um, it'll cost us $100 trillion um, in, in the time up to 2050. Um, and if we have vaccines against these organisms, we'd be much better off because we know vaccines are cost effective. But, you know, the problems are all interrelated. I actually have a slide that, that's not here that shows global health intersecting with all of these things. Um, we've tried to work with animal vaccine companies. The, the, requirements for animal vaccine approval and human vaccine approvals are very different. There's one company in particular that has persisted uh, in trying to move their vaccine forward. And, and actually, so we're, we're working with them. Um, but it's actually been more difficult um, from, uh, to, to move animal vaccine companies uh, and transition them to make human vaccines. Although there, there is the right technology and it's just, a, you know, we have to apply different standards uh, in order to get those vaccines approved. And so, you know, so we have talked to quite a few companies, animal vaccine companies um, over the pandemic in particular, um, and from different countries, they often have an animal vaccine manufacturer, but not a human vaccine manufacturer, but often the technical barriers are, are very substantial, but this could be a good basis for, you know, um, future work, but that, that's a really great question.